Barbara, take it away. Yes, thank you, Linda. As Linda explained, my name is Barbara Barrett, and I'm a history edutainment speaker. That is, I love sharing history in an entertaining way. I'll be your host this evening as we step back in time and explore Chicago's historic Motor Road District from 1905 to 1936. If you love automobiles, particularly antique automobiles, if you appreciate Chicago architecture, or if you love history like I do, you're in the right place. So, ladies and gentlemen, buckle your seatbelts and let's go for a ride. registered for this program probably wondered just what and where is Chicago's historic Motor Road District located? Well, it's a group of 59 properties, primarily located on South Michigan Avenue and secondarily on Wabash and Indiana Avenues between Roosevelt Road on the north, the Stevenson Expressway on the south, McCormick Place on the east, and the Red Line Rapid Transit tracks to the west. Here's a representative map of the area. And let me just orient you. Here is Michigan Avenue, South Michigan Avenue. On the north, we have Roosevelt Road. On the south, Stevenson Expressway. To the west, the rapid transit line along South State Street. And to the east, McCormick Place and the lake. But another interesting feature I want to point out to you here is the Prairie Avenue Historic District right here in the middle. And that is where some of the wealthiest residents in Chicago lived back in the early 1900s. Now Motor Road developed where it did very intentionally and for several reasons. The first of which Michigan Avenue was the gateway to the Prairie District as I indicated in the previous slide where many of Chicago's wealthiest citizens lived. High society resided in the Prairie District. It was close to Chicago's downtown area, the area of commerce and finance. Now, interestingly enough, Michigan Avenue was considered one of the best paved streets in the city. In the early 1900s, the majority of roads throughout the United States were unpaved. So to have a paved avenue right in a major city was quite impressive. And that certainly was Michigan Avenue. It was near the Chicago Coliseum, which at that time was located at 1513 South Wabash Avenue. And this becomes important because it's the venue for the Chicago Auto Show. Interestingly enough, in the early 1900s, air travel was in its infancy and the international aviation meet was held along Michigan Avenue. And there already was one automobile store at 14th and Michigan Avenue. Now at that time, there was no North Michigan Avenue and South Michigan Avenue. There was only Michigan Avenue. Here you see the Chicago Coliseum in this photograph. And this was the venue for the very first Chicago auto show. And that was held in March of 1901, but it was called the first annual National Automobile Exhibit at the Chicago Coliseum. Now the Chicago Auto Show is the largest show in the entire United States. And since it began in 1901, it has been offered every year continuously for the exception of the years between 1942 and 1948 when civilian automobile production was paused and, <clears throat> and factories were converted to producing war munitions during World War II. Now in 2021, the Chicago Auto Show will be celebrating its 113th edition. 
Now here's an example of who lived in the Prairie District. Marshall Field, the first. And as you can see, he lived in quite an imposing structure. This is his residence. Notice it's a three-story three building, all brick and stone. They learned their lesson from the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. No wooden structure here. It also has <clears throat> very ornate work along the, the roof line. And the top floor is a mansard roof, which was very popular at that time, punctuated by dormers. Also, he has his own greenhouse here, right on his own property. Another resident in the Prairie District was George Pullman. He too had a very imposing mansion. Now this one is carved stone, three stories. Once again, mansard roof. And along his roof line, ornamental metalwork. So on your way on South Michigan Avenue to your residence, you had to travel through Motor Row. And as I indicated in 1911, the International Aviation Meet was held right on Chicago's lakefront. And here you have Michigan Avenue, what is Grant, was Grant Park. These railroad um, tracks, which were covered over to make Millennium Park today, and the lake here. So this was the place to be. Now I show you a photograph that was taken the day after the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. Now, besides the obvious devastation from the fire, and make a mental note of this because it plays a part in the building of Motor Row. What you should probably notice here in this photograph, there are no automobiles, only horse-drawn vehicles. But this will change. In only 30 plus years, Chicago has rebuilt itself. And this is the intersection of State and Washington, just a block south of State and Madison. And what do you begin to see here? Yes, we still have horse-drawn vehicles, but we also have an automobile. Now here's a lovely photograph of Lake Michigan Drive in 1905. You can see we have a very lovely wood boardwalk, pedestrian boardwalk, and then off to the other side is carriageway for horse-drawn vehicles. Now it's called Lake Michigan Drive here, but eventually this becomes Lakeshore Drive. But we don't see any automobiles yet. Now Chicago's Motor Row was founded in 1905. And even today, it's considered the largest intact surviving motor colony in the United States, quite possibly the world. And as hard as this may seem to believe, at its peak, as many as 116 different makes of automobiles were sold on Motor Row. Just think about the number of automobile manufacturers today. It's hard to conceive that when the auto was in its infancy, there were as many as 116 different companies producing automobiles. Now Chicago's Motor Row was designated as a Chicago landmark in December of 2000, and it was added to the U.S. National Register of Historic Places on November 18th, 2002. But what was life like for people in 1905, over 100 years ago? Well, the average U.S. worker made between $200 and $400 a year. A new house was about $44,600. Gasoline was 20 cents a gallon. A new car was $1,450. Although as we'll see, Mr. Ford, when he in introduced his Model T, he really brought down the price to $850. A loaf of bread was four cents, but a good horse was only $40. Now in 1905, there were only 8,000 automobiles in the entire United States. But that changed very quickly, as we'll see. And interestingly enough, there was only 144 miles of paved roads. 
Now the names of these early automobile companies, such as Buick, Ford, Hudson, and some names you may never have heard of, Locomobile and Premier, are still visible on the brick and terracotta facades on South Michigan Avenue. And here is a photograph taken not too long ago. And we'll take a look at these buildings, who built them and what you could find for sale inside. Now, interestingly enough, the buildings that were built on Motor Row proudly displayed the names of the automobile companies, such as Buick, Locomobile, Premier, Marmon, Peerless, Hudson, and Ford, who had his name permanently in, in the ter terrazzo floor entrance. Now, Chicago wasn't the only city that had a motor row. They did develop in other cities at the turn of the last century, as car companies really sought to create districts where the sale and service of autos would become an easy urban shopping experience. There were motor rows in Chicago, Oakland, California, of course, Detroit, St. Louis, Missouri, Los Angeles, California, even Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, San Francisco, Canada. San Francisco, California, excuse me. Now I became interested in motor row um, when my husband and I were driving on South Michigan Avenue. We were on our way to a event at Piano Forte, which is located there. And we were stuck in a traffic jam. And while we were waiting, I took a look up and happened to see buildings with these lovely displayed names, Locomobile, Marmot. And because I'm married to an auto enthusiast, I knew that these two companies had a rich history. For example, I knew that in 1908, a Locomobile, fondly renamed Old Number 16, won the Vanderbilt Cup and want in Long Island, New York. Now, why is this significant? Well, prior to this time, the Vanderbilt Cup was always won by European automakers, cars from European automakers. This was the first year that a United States or an American automobile won the Vanderbilt Cup. Now, early on in the auto industry, what were the marks of achievement, endurance, as well as speed. And where did you see this displayed? On the racetrack. So it was important to get your car out there, get it entered into a race and to win. I also knew that the very first Indianapolis 500 race held in 1911 was won by Ray Heron and he was driving a Marmon Wasp, as you can see in this photograph. So let's just take a little brief history of the automobile. First of all, it really was named by the French. And the first patent for an automobile was given to Carl Benz in Germany in 1885. And as I indicated previously, the Europeans dominated the early auto industry with names like Fiat, Benz and Renault. Auto races and endurance runs were used to measure an automobile's quality. It was part of their marketing campaign. Now, the first American automobile appeared in 1893. It, was, it really was offered by bicycle mechanics, Frank and Charles Durier of Springfield, Massachusetts. And as you can see, it's a rather simple affair basically a cart mounted on four wheels. And if you look closely at the driver, he doesn't even have a steering wheel. This is a tiller to control the car. Now, just for comparison's sake, in 1899, 30 American automobile manufacturers produced 2,500 motor vehicles and some 484 
auto companies entered the business in the next 10 years. Now in 1910, there were only 12,926 passenger autos registered in Chicago, compared to 58,000 horse-drawn vehicles. But in just 15 years, those numbers flip-flopped. In 1925, there were 300,000 passenger autos and only 18,000 horse-drawn vehicles registered in Chicago. Now, what did the very first car that drove down Michigan Avenue in Chicago look like? Well, here it is. And the development of Chicago's motor row parallels the growth of the auto industry. In just two decades, the auto evolved from a cart mounted, if you take a look, on two bicycles controlled by a tiller to the sophisticated touring cars that crisscrossed America. So in 1902, we had 600 cars. By 1925, there were 300,000 cars in Chicago. So we went from a simple cart mounted onto two bicycles to something as luxurious as this, the 1912 Cadillac Model 30 touring car. There's that vocal horn, and every time we hear that during the program, there'll be a question, a rhetorical question that you can kind of quiz yourself. So you might have asked yourself, what did automobile manufacturers make before automobiles? Well, if you guessed bicycles, you would be correct. And one of the biggest manufacturers of bicycles was the Winton Bicycle Company. They were located in Cleveland, Ohio, and they were extremely successful. But at the end of the 1800s, there was an economic panic and the bottom fell out of the bicycle industry. But Winton fancied himself in being in the transportation industry, so he quickly switched over to producing automobiles. Now, part of the marketing campaign for Winton, as well as other automobiles, was testimonials. And here in this advertisement, you see a testimonial by Mr. Roy, who took his Winton on an extraordinary journey of 2,255 miles from Mexico to Puget Sound, from sea level to 8,000 feet above, over mountains, roadless steeps, and rocks, through rushing streams, canyons, and adobe mud, and temperatures from two degrees above freezing to 114 degrees Fahrenheit. And yet, his winter never balked or failed him. So you see, when it came to automobiles early on in the industry, these were the types of claims that really convinced buyers that they needed an automobile that they could depend on. If you also guessed horse-drawn horse carriages and wagons, such as the Studebaker Company, Studebaker Brothers located in South Bend, Indiana, you would be correct as well. And here you see one of Studebaker's finest products, a beautiful carriage, Surrey with a fringe on top, if you will. And Studebaker was very successful with their company, but they too were in the transportation business. And when it became apparent that the automobile really wasn't a passing fancy, they were able to quickly switch over to producing automobiles. And this is a 1904 Studebaker Model C. This is their very first gas-powered automobile. Just as a little sidebar here, it's interestingly enough, the Studebaker's original foray into the automobile manufacturing was with electric cars. And we'll talk a little bit about electric cars. Don't think for a moment that Tesla and Mr. Elon Musk has anything new or innovative. Electric cars were available back in the early 1900s. But would you have guessed that 
automobile manufacturers built sewing machines. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the National Sewing Machine Company located right here in Belvedere, Illinois, switched over, or I should say they wanted to expand their product line. So they also introduced the 1904 Eldridge Automobile. Now here's the biggest surprise. The Heinz, Pierce, and Munchauer Company, which produced gilded bird cages and other decorative housewares. They switched over to producing the Pierce Arrow Automobile, a very grand automobile in every sense of the word. And I might add, expensive. This particular Pierce Arrow, as it turns out, was formerly owned by Charlie Chaplin. And one of the defining features of any Pierce Arrow is of course the headlights, which are molded into the fender. So if you go to an auto auction, view one on television, or go to a car show, you'll be able to pick out a Pierce Arrow. Now the range of buildings in Motor Row illustrates the evolution of the automobile showroom. Many of the buildings were built to emulate the grand theaters located in downtown Chicago. Now let's just take a look at this particular drawing of the State and Lake Theater. Now the preferred location was on a corner so that you could have two sides to showcase your product, your business. Here this State Lake Theater <clears throat> at this time consisted of one, two, three floors. And here it has a magnificent tower, very ornate, building, many architectural elements above the windows, along the roof line you had architectural elements and a very nice canopy for the entrance to the building. Now that just was the exterior, but let's take a look at what the interior looked like. Of course you have very grand lighting. You have <clears throat> decorated curved ceilings, mirrored walls, and very important, a grand staircase. Here's a photograph taken on Motor Road not too long ago. These buildings are still there and they still exist over a hundred years since they've been built. This is looking north, northward on Michigan Avenue. And you see that the buildings here the Centaur Motor Car Company, Marmon, Hudson, which we'll get to in a few minutes, really create what is called a street wall. And it's formed by the continuous masonry fronts of these showroom buildings. And this forms an indelible urban image of Chicago at the beginning of the 20th century, when the automobile became a standard feature of American life. Now, as it turns out, Top flight architects such as Alfred Allshuler, Christian Eckstorm, Olaberd and Roach, Jenny Mundy and Jensen, Philip Marr, and Ernest Walker designed many of the buildings on Motor Row. Now, how is it that these particular architects were in Chicago? Well, they flocked to Chicago after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 to help rebuild the city. And they were engaged to build many of the auto showrooms on Motor Row. Now, it won't surprise you that the very first showroom in Chicago's Motor Row district was opened in 1905 by none other than Henry Ford himself. Now, this was very intentional. Mr. Ford was <clears throat> quite a visionary. He was very strategic. And this was his first store opened outside of Detroit, Michigan. It was designed by architect Christian Eckstorm. It had large display windows dominating the ground floor with a band of eight windows on the second floor. Now here is a drawing. Well, actually it is an old timey photograph of that actual building at 1444 46 South Michigan Avenue. Mr. Henry Ford's store. 
As you can see, there were plate glass windows, floor to ceiling on the very first floor. Now that may not seem so revolutionary to us today, but this was a new style of architecture to showcase a new product, the automobile. On the second floor, you have a band of eight windows. Now the entire building was framed in highly glazed terracotta. You can see architectural elements here, diamonds above the second floor. And other things that you might notice about this building really reflects Mr. Ford's patriotism. He was very much pro-American and you can see that American flags draped his showroom windows. And of course, a Model T out in front. That's how this particular building looked in 1905. And today it still stands. And here it is for you. The same original brick, the same terracotta framing, the architectural elements. Now, buildings on Motor Row, the lots were very wide, 50 feet wide, and interestingly enough, 180 feet deep. So they were prime real estate. And what would you see inside the Ford Motor Showroom? Well, you have obviously Model T's for sale, but the showroom is somewhat modest. Yes, we have pillars, but they are not very ornate. You have very simple lighting. You do have a beam ceiling and kind of tucked away here is that grand staircase. Now, Mr. Ford was very frugal. He really didn't believe in spending money on what he called nonsense. So his showroom was very functional, but not necessarily ostentatious. And what would you find for sale in his showroom? Well, a complete lineup of Model T's to choose from. Well, early on, most cars were open cars, such as pictured here, five passenger touring car, fully equipped. Here we have a Roadster. Here we have a two passenger open runabout, fully equipped. Now off to the right here, we have a two passenger coupe equipped with three oil lamps, tubular horn and a kit of tools. Why a kit of tools? Well, think about it. Back in 1911, there were very few gas stations, let alone service garages. So if you were going off um, motoring, you were probably best advised to take your own tools in the event of a breakdown or if you encountered some of those rough roads. Now here at the bottom, you see a six passenger town car. Once again, has three oil lamps, tubular horn and a kit of tools. Now this is an example of what you might find in that showroom. Here's a 1925 Model T. Now Mr. Ford introduced the Model T in 1908 and actually made very few changes to it for the next 20 years, and he sold millions. This particular Model T <clears throat> is from the collection of Jay Leno. The, yes, the comedian and host of The Tonight Show for many, many years. And maybe some of you do know, but most don't, that before Jay Leno was hosting The Tonight Show and doing stand-up comedy, he was a Ferrari mechanic in New York. So he has a tremendous love of automobiles. <coughs> well, what do we have here? The Ugahorn, once again, bringing up a question. So the question you should ask yourself when you look at this particular photograph, um, what is unique about it besides being a lovely antique car? Well, of course, here you have the turn crank to start the engine. But you might notice that the driver is on the right-hand side of the automobile. Now, why was this? Well, early on, early automobiles were really a simple transition from horse-drawn carriages. 
And if you remember how that Studebaker carriage looked, the driver was on the right-hand side. And there was good reason for that because once the driver came to a halt and wanted to step off onto the carriage way or onto the side of the road, it was best to be on the right-hand side of the road because if you stepped off on the left-hand side, well, what would you be stepping off into? Probably a muddy road and or organic material deposited there by a horse. So when things transitioned from horse-drawn carriages to horseless carriages, they still maintain the driver on the right, at least initially. But here's a 1908 Ford Model T. And in 1908, Mr. Ford made the decision for his company to move the drivers to the left-hand side of the car. Now, why was this done? Basically, it was a safety issue. As more automobiles uh, were on the road, two-lane highways, <clears throat> it was better line of sight for the driver to be on the left-hand side. But not all com car companies switched over, and some never switched over. It was a certain savoir-faire or cachet to having a right-hand drive automobile. Now we come to the Buick Motor Company showroom, which is, was located at 1454 South Michigan Avenue, built in 1907, once again, by architect Christian Ekstorn. Now, what do we see here in this building? Well, a little bit more sophisticated building. We have two areas of floor to ceiling windows. We have a second floor with Palladian window treatments. And of course, the Buick name, which is permanently affixed carved in stone on the building. You know, at this time for <clears throat> retail establishments, uh, merchants did not have neon signs nor did they have signs hanging out from their building. The earmark of a sophisticated upscale retail outlet was having your name permanently affixed to your business location. And this is what, <coughs> and this is what you might find in the Buick showroom. And the Uga horn also brings up another question. This is a beautiful 1905 Buick Touring car. It's an open car, as many of the early autos were. But another thing you should notice about this particular automobile is the brass headlights and the brass name on the front of the car. From 1905 to 1915, roughly, the style of high-end, elegant cars really included brass work. So this is an example of the brass era. Next, we come to the BF Goodrich Company. This building still stands there as well on Motor Row. It was built in 1911, once again, by Christian Ekstorm. But what do we see here? Now we're going to three stories. The first story, of course, street level, floor to ceiling, windows. Second floor, you see a little bit more elegant treatment of windows, a little bit of a Palladian effect. Third floor, mansard roof, reminiscent of Marshall Field's residence as well as George Pullman, mansard roof punctuated by dormers. Now, why was this particular architectural style adopted on Motor Row? For a couple of reasons. One, they wanted to fit in with the neighborhood and there were many mansions in that area that were of this empire style. So Goodrich decided to build its building in the style of the neighborhood. Now we come to the Marmon Motor Car Company. And you may never have heard of a Marmon Motor Car, but in 1922, the Marmon Motor Car Showroom was located at 2232 South Michigan Avenue. Now it was built by architect Alfred Alshuler. 
and he became known as the builder of automobile palaces. Now, this is a picture, this is a photograph of the particular building as it exists presently, but let's take a little closer look. Now we have a much wider building. We have two stories. Once again, street level, floor to ceiling windows. The second level, we have several banks of windows and we have a clay tile roof in the Spanish style, Spanish mission style. The Marmon name prominently displayed, ornaments along the roof line, and the entire facade is highly glazed terracotta. And once you entered just above entering the door, you would see the Marmon name with some very elegant ironwork. Now, what did you find inside the Marmon Motor Car Company showroom? Well, quite a different showroom than the Ford Company. Here you see vaulted ceilings, a much airier and lighter air showroom. Yes, product displayed here throughout. But what did you also see? Palm trees. Yes, because they wanted to give you the feeling of a faraway look, where you could go in an automobile if you were the proud owner. And of course, a staircase. And what would you find in the Marmon showroom? Well, if you were there in 1910, you might have seen this particular vehicle. Very handsome, I might add. It's on display at the Studebaker Museum in South Bend, Indiana. If you visited in 1922, you might see the a Marmon touring car. And if you were there in 1929, you might think, I want to purchase a Marmon Roosevelt, which was one of their automobiles manufactured as a nod to Teddy Roosevelt. And we'll explain why in a few slides. Next, we come to 2000 South Michigan Avenue, the Locomobile Motor Car Company was built in 1909 by Jenny Mundy and Jensen. It is a very imposing building. This is <clears throat> how it looks today. You can see red brick, very handsome red brick. It's a wide building. It's on the corner. Corner location was important. Several banks of windows on the second and third floor. The locomobile name proudly displayed and the windows and building framed in highly glazed terracotta. Now, this particular <clears throat> building today is a residential building. It's the Locomobile Lofts. It was one of the first conversions on Motor Road to residential property in 2004. Across the street, you see the Second Presbyterian Church and its congregation included such people as Marshall Field and George Pullman. Now, what would you see inside the Locomobile building? Well, on the first floor, of course, you would see the showrooms proudly displaying product. On the second floor, you'd encounter storerooms. And, oh, what do we see here? Old number 16, which won the Vanderbilt Cup in 1908. On the top floor, you might see offices, top salesmen, etc. Now in the showroom, you would find an automobile such as this the a locomobile. Now take a look at this showroom. We have very ornate columns, we have beam ceilings, and a very grand staircase. And if you were in the locomobile showroom in 1910, you might see this lovely automobile. Once again, you see the brass work. It's a 1910 model. It's in the brass era. Now here's an example of a locomobile from 1926. I took this particular photograph at the Arlington International Race Course a few summers ago when they were having an automobile show. You can take a look at the size of this car, but what kind of people could afford a locomobile? It was extremely high end. Well, let's take a look here. A 1926 locomobile found their ways into the garages of people such as William Wrigley, Lawrence Copley Thaw, William Carnegie, 
Reggie Vanderbilt, William Vanderbilt, and General John J. Blackjack Pershing. Well, what did it cost? Let's take a look at some of its competition. A Packard, which was nothing to sneeze at back in 1926, cost $3,750, which might not seem a lot to us today, but when you were only making between $200 and $400 a year, that was quite a king's ransom. A Lincoln V8 was $4,000. A Pierce Arrow was $5,250. But that locomobile that I had in the previous slide, a locomobile 48-6, Stevens Durier 6, was $7,500. In today's dollars, it's over a million. So you see, you had to be rather well-heeled to afford a locomobile. Next, we come to the Hudson Motor Company, which was next door to Marmon, 2222 South Michigan Avenue. Now, this was built in the Spanish Baroque style in 1923 by architect Alfred Altshuler, builder of motor palaces. Here, it's an imposing structure. Very wide floor to ceiling windows on the first floor, a second floor, several banks of windows, a third floor, several banks of windows, but in a Palladian style, terracotta clay roof, ornaments along the roof line, and very interesting treatment of the windows in the middle. And we'll focus in on that. Here above the doorway, you had, even though this was a window here, you had that treatment of an archway, and of course, very prominently displayed H for Hudson. Here's a photograph of the interior of the Hudson Motor Building at present, looking out onto the street. You can see we have columns here, but they are very um, interesting treatment in the plaster. You have a marble floor and you have a great deal of natural light coming in. Now the Hudson building today, you can see it here, right next door to the Marmon building. <clears throat> but in 2018, the Hudson building was sold, or I should say purchased by two former Chicago Bears, Israel Ordonezhi and Julius Peppers. They purchased it for $10 million and it's their intention to renovate it and make it a multi-purpose use building. There will be residential space, there'll be commercial space, there will be space for offices, as well as for social events. And what would you see in a Hudson Motor Showroom? Well, here's an example of a Hudson from 1911. Now, even though Mr. Ford changed over to right, left-hand drive in 1908, many car companies, Hudson being one, actually was resistant to changing over. They considered themselves a high-end automobile and the right-hand drive was an earmark of a luxury automobile. <coughs> but in 1928, around that time period, Hudson really also introduced um, a more economical vehicle such as this 1928 Hudson Coupe. But the reason why we had the Ooga horn here is because we want to take a look at this um, in interesting seating here on the exterior of the passenger compartment. Now, some of you, and I'd like to ask you what you think the name of this particular seat is. Now, most of you might think it is a rumble seat and you would be correct. But there's another name for it. And that would be the mother-in-law seat. <laughs> now we come to a series of buildings starting with 2301 South Michigan Avenue, and that's the Cadillac building. Now, what do we see with Cadillac? Well, one, two, three, four, five stories high, a very shiny white brick building. Next to it is the Cowles building and then the Saxon building. Now the Cadillac building, the architect was Ginny Mundy and Jensen. 
and the Coles and Saxon buildings, that architect was Holabird and Roche. Now the architectural firm of Holabird and Roche built many buildings in Chicago. And some that you might recall, of uh, course, was the original Soldier's Field. That was the architects were Holabird and Roche, as well as City Hall in Chicago. And what would you find in that interior of the building? Well, once again, here you have showrooms on the first floor for uh, new model cars, as well as for used cars. You have a, a wash rack here. Now, these buildings also had freight elevators, large ones. Here's two of them actually in this building to move product from floor to floor. On the second floor, you have a paint booth, a finishing room, and on the top floor, your stock room. And what would you find in the Cadillac building? Something like this, a 1925 Cadillac Town sedan. Once again now, the passenger compartments are moving from open cars to closed cars, more comfort. And if you were fortunate enough to be shopping for a Cadillac in 1930, this is what you might find in the showroom. Now you might wonder who could afford automobiles at all at that time. But if you remember in the Roaring Twenties, many people really <clears throat> did well financially before the Great Depression started. Now we come to the Maxwell Briscoe showroom, which was built in 1910. Once again, corner location at 1737 South Michigan Avenue. The architect here was Ernest Walker. This is quite an imposing building. One, two, three, four stories high. It was a brown wired brick and each window bank was flanked, especially the ones on the corners with terracotta treatment, highly glazed terracotta. Now something, if you take a closer look, is something you might notice at the street level are all these piles of rubble. And you might think, what's going on here? Are the streets under construction? And that would not be the case at all. These particular piles of rubble were there intentionally. And these are actually the original test track for automobiles. If you came shopping to Maxwell Briscoe, you could take a ride in the car test drive it and make sure it could go over rubble and it could take on uh, unpaved roads and still not fail you. And here is how that Maxwell Briscoe building looks today. Still very beautiful, even a hundred years later. This building is all residential property at the present time. <coughs> Now, Maxwell's aren't on the road today, but they were the preferred car of one very famous comedian. And if you guessed who these individuals are in this particular photograph, if you guessed Jack Benny with his sidekick Rochester, you'd be correct. And, very, and here in the middle, you see a very young Frank Sinatra. At the end of Motor Row, the southernmost tip, you will find the Illinois Automobile Club. Now, of course, people who are well healed and um, of the motoring mindset needed a place to socialize. So they pooled their money and had the Auto Illinois Automobile Club built. It's at 2400 to 2410 South Michigan Avenue. It's an imposing structure built in the Spanish mission style by architect Philip Marr. But look at the year in which it was built, 1936. And actually the building was never completed on the interior. It was supposed to contain several ballrooms, an Olympic style pool, as well as a winter garden and an interior courtyard. But because it was completed one, well into the Great Depression, it was never finished the way it was intended to be. 
<clears throat> this particular clock tower here in the middle was supposed to be 13 stories high and it was supposed to have an imposing cupola on the top. Plus still it does exist and on top of it is a weather vane in the shape of an automobile. But this particular building, as I said, was never finished and used for um, socializing because of the Great Depression had set in. But today this building, <clears throat> you can take a look, it still exists. And here's an aerial view. Here's South Michigan Avenue and the Stevenson Expressway. But this building today has been repurposed. It is called Revel Motor Row. And it is now used for social events, conventions. Here we have a setting for a wedding and a couple guests entering the building for a lovely reception that evening. We've covered a lot of ground here, ladies and gentlemen. And just think about all of these particular automobile companies that had showrooms on Motor Row, but they no longer exist today. Packard, Jackson, Locomobile, but we still have Ford Motor Company, we still have Buick, and Chevrolet as well, and Cadillac. But it is quite astounding when you think about how many automobiles were for sale when the auto was first introduced to the American public. Here's a directory of the various agencies that were on Motorola. Now I want to circle back for a moment to the 1911 Chicago newspaper, the Chicago Examiner. This particular article really was touting the automobile show, the Chicago Automobile Show. And as I said, it started in 1901 and was offered every single year since. But in 1911, a couple exciting things happened. First of all, all of Michigan Avenue became electrified with electric lights. Secondly, the electric starter was introduced for automobiles. No longer hand cranking was necessary. And also in 1911, because of the success and popularity of the Chicago Auto Show, it was offered twice a year, once in October and then in the spring. And I also chose to give you a, a few photographs of the Pierce Arrow exhibit at the Chicago Auto Show. Now, because the Pierce Arrow building no longer exists, I chose these particular photographs because for Pierce Arrow Company, they reproduce their showroom right on the floor of the Chicago Auto Show. You can see very impressive, imposing automobiles. Now, here's an example of a 1915 Pierce Arrow. Still right-hand drive, but it looks like he might be the chauffeur for this gentleman in the back. And, what, are this, what is the defining feature of a Pierce Arrow? Headlights molded into the fender. Once again, another lovely Pierce Arrow. Here's one that I took a photograph of a 1931 Pierce Arrow at the same um, show at Arlington National Race Track. Now, if you were a motorist early on, what would you be wearing? A whole new industry, a whole new way of living required an entire new wardrobe. Now, this lovely young lady on the left, she's wearing a full length duster. You can see she has goggles, gloves, and a lovely chapeau. This gentleman in the middle, he has <clears throat> a full length coat of mohair material. He has gloves for motoring, and a very sporty hat. This lady here on the right has a full length leather coat. Now, originally, remember that automobiles were open cars. And also you had to travel on, uh, let's say, less than preferred unpaved roads. So you dressed like this because you were driving on roads such as this, where it wouldn't be too difficult to understand you have to protect yourself even though you're out for a drive. And back in the early 1900s, the majority of roads in the United States were in this type of condition, unpaved, wet, and muddy. But that wasn't a problem. 
All you had to do was go to the car wash. And here's an example of an early car wash. It was called an auto wash bowl. And it was in the shape of a circle. And if you were a high wheeler, you could venture in further into the center of the wash bowl to get your automobile cleaned off. But you could also go around the perimeter if your vehicle was a little bit closer to the pavement. Interesting. So what were the reasons for decline of motor roll? Well, in 1920, the Michigan Avenue bridge across the Chicago River opened. Now the elite residents of the Prairie Avenue district abandoned that neighborhood and went north to North Michigan Avenue area to Astor Street in the Gold Coast on the north side. In, 19, in October of 1929, the stock market crashed and the Great Depression began. This tremendously affected the economic position of many people. And in 1941, the United States entered World War II and civilian automobile production ceased. Even after World War II, there was a whole change of thinking and automobile dealers moved to larger indoor showrooms with big auto lots on such streets as Ashland Avenue in Chicago, Western, Cicero Avenues, and other city and suburban locations to be closer to their customers. Now here is a photograph of the Michigan Avenue Bridge, which was completed in 1920. But I chose this view from the north looking south because it also illustrates this particular building, the London Guarantee Building, which was the architect for this building was Alfred A. Schuller. And here you have a gentleman trying to sell one of his automobiles, which probably cost a handsome sum, and he couldn't even sell it for $100 after the Great Depression began. So let's take a little side trip off of Motor Row and take a look at some people, famous and infamous, and their automobiles. Now, if I asked you, who was the very first US president to be photographed riding in a car in 1902? You might answer, Teddy Roosevelt, and you would be correct. And as a matter of fact, that auto he is riding in is an electric car in 1902. And if I asked you who was the architect or who harnessed the assembly line to produce mass produce automobiles, I hope you would say Henry Ford. He was a visionary and an engineer, but he failed to recognize some of the trends going forward in the automobile industry. That's the subject of another talk for another day. In January of 1914, Henry Ford started paying his auto workers a remarkable $5 a day, doubling the average wage, which helped ensure a stable workforce and likely boosted sales since workers could now afford to buy the cars they were making. And his cars, as I said, were for sale for about $850. But there's another reason why he offered a $5 a day wage. Many of the people who were drawn to work in the factories were from uh, rural communities. And working on the assembly line, quite frankly, was monotonous. So to compensate them for their lack of, let's say, outdoorsiness and for <clears throat> the monotony, he offered them an attractive wage. And it worked. Here we find another locomobile, a 1905 locomobile. And who might this Native American be riding along? Well, if you guessed Apache Chief Geronimo, you would be correct. And he really quite amassed a fortune traveling in the Wild Bill Hickok Wild West show throughout the United States and Europe as well. 
and he sort of uh, rewarded himself with an, a 1905 locomobile. <laughs> and here you have a very infamous Chicagoan <clears throat> who purchased a 1928 Cadillac pound sedan right on Motor Row. And if you guessed Al Capone, you'd be correct. But of course, Mr. Capone made some modifications once he took delivery of this car. He had the, the doors reinforced with extra metal so um, bullets couldn't penetrate. And this window at the back was stationary or static when it was manufactured. But he had modifications made so that it could be rolled down when <clears throat> in hot pursuit, um, he and his colleagues could uh, evade the police. Now you might think of this lovely young lady in the um, aeronautic industry, but in fact, Amelia Earhart was also a auto enthusiast. And here she is with her Hudson Essex Terraplane Special. And who might be a couple? They really enjoyed 1932 Ford V8s. But interestingly enough, <clears throat> if you guessed buying Clyde, you'd be correct. Now they really liked Ford V8s, but they never really owned one. They just borrowed them. And Clyde Barrow was so impressed with the Ford V8, he took it upon himself to write directly to Mr. Ford. Let's just take a quick look at what message he had for Mr. Ford. While I still have got breath in my lungs, I'll tell you what a handy car you make. I've drove Fords exclusively when I could get away with one. For sustained speed and freedom from trouble, the Ford has got other cars skinned. And even if my business hasn't been strictly legal, it don't hurt anything to tell you what a fine car you got in the V8. Yours truly, Clyde Champion Barrow. Now, Mr. Barrow <clears throat> sent this letter to Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford was not pleased to receive such glowing reviews from a criminal, but yet you can still find this original letter displayed <clears throat> in Greenfield Village in Michigan, if you visit that museum. A couple more slides for us here. Who was the very first individual to crisscross the United States? And that was Dr. Horatio Nelson Jackson, along with his mechanic, Sewell Crocker, and faithful companion, Bud. In 1903, he went from San Francisco to New York in <clears throat> a Winton automobile. Now, he actually took this uh, particular journey on as a dare, as a bet, where he was challenged to drive across the United States in less than 90 days. So he took the $50 bet, and he did make it across um, in 63 days. So he beat the record, but he did finance his trip at his own expense. He spent $8,000. And interestingly enough, he never collected on his $50 bet. Now, ladies were not to be outdone either. In 1909, the first woman to drive across the United States was Alice Ramsey. Now she drove a 1909 Maxwell from San Francisco, uh, from, pardon me, from New York to San Francisco. And she really completed her journey in record time. She beat Dr. Um, Horatio Nelson by four days. She completed her journey in 59 days as opposed to Dr. Jackson's 63 days. And here's a picture of a photograph of Alice spending a little time on Chicago's Motor Road. She stopped on her way to San Francisco. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've come to the end of my presentation today. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed making the presentation. But at this point, I'd like to have a special shout out to my husband, Chuck Barrett, who is an auto enthusiast and without his support, my program would not have been possible. So I know we've run over a bit, but if there are any questions, we'd like to take them at this time.
Do we have any questions? Lina? There aren't any questions about that right now. Not right now. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention this evening. As I say, I hope you've enjoyed as much as I've enjoyed presenting. And if you have any uh, questions you might think of, you can send them into the Skokie Public Library and they'd be sent on to me and I'd be happy to research and answer them. Thank you. And I hope you have a good evening and a very happy holiday season. Good night. Thank you very much, enjoyed it. You're welcome, you're welcome.